So, hey guys, welcome to today's video. In today's video, I've got Susanna, uh, first year of VetchMed at Jesus College, and we'll be having a short veterinary medicine interview, um, kind of like a mock to tell you guys, uh, or to show you guys what it's like. So, um, before we start, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Medify UK for making this video possible, and uh, do make sure to check out the link below and to go and um, check out their resources. So, let's just imagine this is a completely, like, you know, you, you don't know me, I'm an interviewer. You're applying to um, Cambridge Study Vet Med, um, and the tickets. So hello, I'm um, Dr. Sen. How are you doing? What's your yeah, name? I'm Susanna. Lovely to meet you. Wonderful. Um, so, welcome to uh, welcome to the interview. Um, in today's interview, we'll be talking about a variety of clinical questions, but mm -hmm. also um, a few scientific questions, okay. just to analyse, um, you know, why you really want to spend the next six years of your life doing veterinary medicine, okay. but also why you want to study here at Cambridge. So could you firstly tell me why are you applying um, here to Cambridge? study veterinary medicine as opposed to all of the other uh, schools that you can apply to? Well, to the best of my knowledge, in the UK there's eight major veterinary schools mm -hmm. and Cambridge has like, is believed to be one of the best ones. Sure. And as a person who wants to work with like exotics and wildlife animals, well, exotics and wildlife, I think that Cambridge can give me like the, well not the papers, but will give me the experience and will give me afterwards opportunities to work in many countries in the world mm -hmm. that's what I'm most interested in. All right. So I'm hoping to just like gain connections throughout the world. Wonderful. Um, so you've mentioned all these great facilities that Cambridge has to offer. Um, where do you hear about these things? Um, I have quite a few friends who go to Cambridge, like older than me, because oh, I also have an older brother. So like, sure. some of his friends got into Cambridge and all of them like really enjoyed their experience here and they said it's lovely and both like the facilities are basically a work of art and just like the atmosphere and like both the social sphere and the educational. So I'm just hoping to like continue their stuff, follow their steps. So it's nice to hear that you've um, you know, done your research before applying, right? I guess you don't want to end up at a university uh, where the course isn't too familiar. Yeah. Um, so could you quickly outline to me why exactly you'd like to study veterinary medicine as opposed to all the other career options mm. and degrees that you may have to follow? Well, I always knew that I was interested in science. So like, just since I can remember, I always knew that humanities, humanities wasn't really my thing. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to do something where I can see the effects of my job, like what, what the effects of my work, when I can actually help like every individual patient who come to see me. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to do that. And I just honestly cannot imagine myself doing anything but veterinary medicine. Sure. It's just something that I feel like I'll be really, really passionate about. And like I will genuinely enjoy the six years ahead of me. So you mentioned just now that you, you can't imagine yourself doing anything other than veterinary medicine. Have you possibly done any work experience to do with vet med or? Um, I have. I mostly work with horses, but I also had a work placement at a small animal clinic. Mm -hmm. And with horses, I worked um, both in an elevation of Arab horses, which allowed me to see like both how like foals are manipulated, how they're brought up, how they're like how the horses are bred, and what we look into. Mm -hmm. But I've also had like the opportunity to look more into the riding stables, okay. so I could like compare the two kinds of worlds, and I really enjoyed that. Sure. So, could you possibly talk about a memorable experience that you had um, back, you know, when working with horses or at your small animal um, clinic? Um, actually, one of the experiences which, like, really stuck with me was when once we were woken up at 5 a.m. because the mares were in heat and some of the ponies, like, ran, up, ran out of their stables and just started, like, chasing the mares on the field. And they got pretty beat up because of the height, height difference and in general, and we had to, like, run around in the mud at 5 a.m. Gotcha. with, like, torches looking for them. Quite exciting. So possibly, could you maybe talk about a problem that you saw in work experience and how the other veterinary surgeons um, sort of, you know, how they dealt with these problems? Um, we had quite a problem because one of the pastures was not recently checked, like there, there wasn't a checkup of the earth, like to look mm -hmm. at the bacteria in it. So quite a few horses started developing like mites and like started like grazing, not grazing, but they started like biting each other and sure. just like scratching all over. So like that really affected their fur and their... It was, it was becoming increasingly harder to catch them because they knew that every single time we went and we tried to apply like the creams to like their manes and tails like to help them like it really hurt them and we tried to isolate them but like the, it was most like the problem that you have to remember of prevention because it's usually much better than treatment and if sure. only we would have run the tests of the earth like it would have it could have easily been prevented because they could have been moved to a different pasture so you just mentioned um, prevention is better than treatment. Mm -hmm. Could you possibly sort of further, um, you know, further what you mean on that? Um, because most times, like right now, I think uh, eighty percent of money, especially in the UK, of the budget is going to like treatment of diseases, which could have been easily preventable even by things just washing hands or just like social campaigns to work, raise awareness. So could you possibly give me an example 
of um, how prevention can be better than treatment. Um, like for example, there was the, the case of a cholera outbreak in the UK, mm-hmm. and that's a disease which is like it's it's like terminal, but it can be really easily prevented just like sure. by washing hands and making sure that your food is safe and stuff like that. And the water supply is and clean. The water supply is clean, mm-hmm. and I think in the end, like they found out that all the bacteria were like focused in one well, like that was yeah. their main breeding spot, and just by like, closing that down, we managed to like so cut down the death toll and like manage the disease. Brilliant. Well done. So you mentioned bacteria actually, and how they were in the soil and how that affected the quality of the soil. Um. What sort of organism is a bacteria? Could you possibly um, draw a bacteria for me and sort of outline uh, what it looks like? Okay, try my best. <laughs> just a rough <laughs> sketch, just to sort of um, show what it looks like. Cilia. Yep. Mm, the exchange. The genetic material contained in the genophore in the center. Mm-hmm. Might have a slime capsule to mm-hmm. maintain hydration because they can quite easily exchange materials with the outside. Wonderful. The cell wall, mm-hmm. cell membrane, but not always. Mm-hmm. They will have free floating ribosomes and what do ribosomes do? Ribosomes they put, like synth- they're used in the synthesis of proteins. Oh fun, okay, sure. Fun. <laughs> and they don't really have organelles because they don't have a compartmentalized structure. Sure, brilliant. Um and what these flagella you've drawn, what is the function of a flagella and how does it help certain types of bacteria? Um, it's mostly used for movement because they have some motor units here which mm-hmm. allow the tail to move and like for the bacteria to move throughout the body more efficiently. Sure, brilliant. Um, so, bacteria, you said, you mentioned the word prokaryote earlier, mm-hmm. um, how is a prokaryote different to a eukaryotic cell? Um, like, according, recently we accepted into some symbiotic theory that eukaryotes actually evolved from prokaryotes, that they were like engulfed at some point and then just like learned to like live in a symbiotic relationship, mm-hmm. so there are quite a few similarities, but they differ mainly through the fact that prokaryotes don't have a compartmentalized structure, Sure. so... That can that also leads to the fact that they're much more simple because it can have organelles which will allow to like for specific functions for mm-hmm. the accumulation of enzymes in a specific pH in a certain point. Mm-hmm. But also like the mechanism of cell division, like prokaryotes usually divide by binary fission, while sure. eukaryotes use mitosis and meiosis. Um, Could you name me certain organelles that a eu- eukaryotic cell has that a prokaryotic cell doesn't have? Uh, for example. Mitochondria, just like endoplasmic right. reticulum, both okay. rough and smooth. Nucleus, because in prokaryotes, like the g- DNA is found free floating in the genophore region. Wonderful. So you have these, maybe you've learned about this A level, possibly, you have these things called plasmids in prokaryotes, yes. and particularly in bacteria, right? And what are plasmids? Have you heard of them before? Um, plasmids are just like re- independent regions of circular DNA, which are often used like between bacteria to exchange genetic material. Mm-hmm. So they can like convey, and this is especially important like in disease because often it will like encode resistance for a certain antibiotic. So mm-hmm. that allows like the fast spread of resistance for a colony. Brilliant. Um, okay, perfect. And how can this, how can this resistance spread, and how could that be of significance? Um, because like the plasma can be transferred between bacteria, and the, the other bacterium can incorporate it into its own DNA. And then, Wonderful. Like, and do you know the two main methods by which you can get this spread of um, resistance? No. <laughs> so, yeah, so the two main ways are possibly when this bacteria divides, mm-hmm. this plasma is going to be copied as well, whilst you know you have this binary fission, therefore, you have this thing called vertical transmission mm-hmm. where the plasma is copied into daughter cells. But then um, you can also have horizontal transmission where this plasmid can be copied and transferred to other species and strains of bacteria. As a consequence, one bacteria with antibiotic resistance can pass it onto other cells. Brilliant. So, you mentioned mitochondria. Oh, sorry, I'll take this back. Um, so, you mentioned mitochondria. Um, what is the function of a mitochondria? Well, mitochondria is like a very well-known phrase in the A-levels, are the powerhouse of the cell. Sure. So they are involved in, a- in the production of ATP, which is the main source of energy in the body. Mm-hmm. And like that's their main function. Sure. Um, brilliant. So these mitochondria, uh, could you possibly talk about the stage of respiration that take place? Okay, so we recently were told that the four main station, uh, stages are glycolysis, mm-hmm. and there's the link reaction, which... Uh, com- then there's the link reaction, thanks to which like the products of glycolysis enter the mitochondria. Mm-hmm. Then there's the citric acid cycle, and it ends with oxidative phosphorylation. Brilliant. Um, all right, that's 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 um, very good. Now, could you compare aerobic respiration to anaerobic mm-hmm. respiration and tell the advantages of both in different situations? Okay, so aerobic respiration occurs in the presence of oxygen, mm-hmm. and it allows us to produce more energy sure. because it is required for oxidative phosphorylation, which is the last stage of uh, respiration mm-hmm. and without it we can also get 
um, energy just from glycolysis so that like yields a much lower amount of ATP mm-hmm. however that's like that's like if we're sprinting or if we're doing like a high intensity activity we mm-hmm. might just like use that and then produce lactate during it because right. like that allows us to do it like quicker if we can't have oxygen Brilliant. but we usually try to like especially for long term exercise for like some long duration we try to use aerobic because <coughs> that just like allows us to have more ATP so back when you're doing A levels, and of course once you get into your veterinary school, you have or you may have already had a lot of things to do at one point in time, you know, um, many tasks, extracurricular things, academic things, auto balance, and of course sometimes things can get stressful. Um, what what methods do you do you use to um, de stress and to cope with the workload at times? Mm, I would say that usually I try to prevent stress. I try to like set up my work so I do it like over a longer period of time mm-hmm. but a shorter interval so mm-hmm. that it doesn't accumulate. But when I do get stressed and it gets too much, like I really enjoy the outdoors, sure. which I think also relates to like the job that I want to do. Mm-hmm. So I will usually go for a run or for a walk with my dog. And what usually what helps me the most is like talking to my parents, to my friends, and just like detaching myself completely from the work for a bit to like sure. let my brain breathe and just relax. And what is the importance of de stressing like this, as you mentioned? Um, I think it's really important because it lets you gain like perspective on what you're doing and it also just like help both your mental health but like it also like affect your relationships with other people sure. and it will also like affect your work ethic because you can better concentrate and like better assimilate information if you're like quite relaxed about it exactly and i think that's really important especially afterwards if i'm planning on studying for six years i will have to learn how to deal with stress wonderful um well um i think that's all the questions i have for you today so um thank you for coming along thank you very uh, much i wish you the best of luck with your consequent interviews and hopefully i'll see you around soon sure. Thank you, Thank lovely you. to meet you. Brilliant. Uh, okay, that's the mock interview done. So, okay, now let's talk to the camera. So, that's the mock interview done. Uh, we're going to very quickly talk about things that Susanna did well and um, things that, uh, you know, a bit of advice that she can give to you guys when you guys are applying for your um, veterinary medicine interviews. Yeah, I'll try so. my best. <laughs> so, what do you think went well about that interview? Um, I think it's good that even if, like, because some of the questions I wasn't too sure about the answer, but mm-hmm. if you just kind of ch- try to show them that you can uh, connect information from various, like, pieces of your knowledge and put them together to try and formulate some kind of hypothesis, mm-hmm. like, some kind of opinion, that's quite good. And also if you show, like, personal interest in a topic, like, if you show that you actually know some stuff about the subject you're talking about, so for example, I talked about the cholera outbreak, so it shows that you're interested and, like, throughout your life you've been looking at stuff, which would kind of lead towards your subject, that's quite nice, they quite like that. Um, do you think that you were quite, in terms of answering questions, did you try and follow structure to answer questions or did you try and... Um, I tried, but also if you're like at an interview, you will be quite stressed. So don't worry if you can't, like if your answer isn't like that well structured, if you're mm-hmm. just like saying random things at random times, they do understand that. Like they know that you're not robots and you don't actually know the questions. So they will be like lenient, even if you just like stutter or mumble or like say something that doesn't really make sense, but then correct yourself. So it's fine. But I think at times you were unsure about a few of the questions I asked. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> so in that situation, would you suggest maybe taking a pause and thinking about the question as opposed to going straight into it? Um, I think that's a really good method. I don't really do that, but that's just because it's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, like, if you're unsure about a question, do tell your interviewers that you haven't covered this yet. Mm-hmm. But also try and like make something, like not make something up. Like Don't say something that's false, because they will know it. They are quite smart. But if you think that you could make like a pretty well educated guess go for it okay uh brilliant. so what i think you did work really well was um you were quite motivated throughout the whole mm-hmm. thing you were really smiley and being positive is really important yeah. because these interviews are tough everyone knows that yeah. but if you're able to stay positive if you're able to push through and sort of show that you're still enthusiastic and you're, you're still willing to apply yourself in such situations um you know that's the attitude they're looking for especially since we were told that they also judge your character like our director of studies told us that during the interviews he was looking at which kind of people he would like to spend the next six years with so if he didn't like you exactly (laughs) one thing that actually i mentioned in the past video even with path is they're looking for how teachable you are so if they think that they can sit down and teach you something then they're going to like you and they'll want to take you because what's the point of you know having a person sitting in front of you that's not listening to you, that's not yeah. talking? It's, not, it's, it's a waste of time for the director of studies, right? So when you are in an interview, try and be as enthusiastic as possible, be open to your, open to your ideas, and make sure you listen more than anything, because you yeah. don't want to end up talking yeah. relevantly. Um, brilliant. So I think your diagram, you know, in an interview, <laughs> or this diagram, you know, 
It's, it's still pretty good for what I could probably draw. Um, in the interview, if you would like to draw a diagram, by all means you can ask for some pen and paper. Yeah, also for maths, for equations, it's really useful. Mm. Because you're scribbling it down, firstly it makes it easier for you to understand, secondly it shows them that you are you know, proactive and you yeah. happily write it out and explain something. Um, but what other advice do you think you have for um, people applying? For me to like show them your way of thinking, because for example during my interview I got handed a skull and I was asked what is this animal and what did it die of? I had no idea, but you just look at I just looked at it and tried to be like, oh, it has like small teeth, like they look like milk teeth, so it might be young, then the shape. So you just kind of like try and work your way around it to show them like how you're thinking and how you approach the problem, because they do want people who just like approach the task and like try their best, like even if they won't manage. So yeah, I think what's really important is that you work through things step by step. Yeah. Avoid jumping, you know, from the question to the conclusion. Try and share the new thought yeah, process. Just, like, just think out loud. Just don't tell them the exact answer, but like how you're building up to it. And even if you do know the answer, sort of try and show them that you're at yeah. least thinking through it. Because they'll, even if you, whatever you do, they'll realise that you know it, because you'll be quite quick with it. Um, also, if you don't have an idea, let's say they ask you a question, you have no clue at all. Just tell them. Because... Tell them, but as well as telling them, would you, <laughs> is it better to stay blank, do you think? Or would you say it's better to try and use relevant knowledge from your A-level and link it to the question. Good to say, try and use relevant knowledge, but what I did, I like I told them that I hadn't like learned about this, but I think that looking back on the stuff I know that if I put it together, this would be like an answer which would make sense, but I'm not sure of it. Sure. So whatever happens, don't be scared of using yeah. similar knowledge that you have. Especially since if you don't know, they will give you bits of information which will allow you to build up the answer. So they're really helpful with that. And you kind of you can kind of end up connecting the dots when yeah. you get the answer, and you, it's really satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, thank you so much for joining no me today. Um, and once again, thank you so much to Medify for supporting this video and making it possible. <laughs> uh, Medify, yeah. you, you've got to you've got to put the plug in. Um, so make sure to subscribe and make sure to check out the next video um, where a first year medic at Jesus as opposed to a vet med will be interviewed like this as well. Thanks for watching guys and we'll see you soon.